Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Ah, uh, I've got to say, it, it, there's so much stuff I want to produce at the moment, but it's just difficult because of, you know, what's going on in my house, work is everywhere. Bear with me though, um, but ArenaNet did release a short story, sort of a saving grace for me because this video I'll actually be able to put out for today. ArenaNet released a short story to do with Halloween and a lot of you have been asking that I get up to date with the short stories a bit quicker so that you can use these videos instead of reading them, but you actually get to uh, experience the story in a timely fashion. So today I'm going to be reading to you guys The Family Business. This was written by John Ryan and put out on October 17th. John Ryan isn't a name I think I recognise? Question mark from many of these short stories, if any. I doubt it will really mean that it reads particularly differently. I, I rarely notice actual different writing styles between the different people doing the stories. But hey, anyway, so this is to do with Mad King Thorn and his son. Let's jump straight into it. By the third night, the mob around Castle Thorn had grown so thick that their bonfires reached the river, making a constellation of pyres that stretched as far as King Oswald Thorn could see. I swore my sandwich trees would have been the answer to this famine, Oswald grumbled. They are complaining about the famine, right? Dribbin, the king's wizened counsellor, felt his throat go dry. The king was not above beheading counsellors who delivered bad news. Your endeavour to feed the populace by putting meat, cheese and bread in the ground was a valiant one, your majesty, but this is about another matter. Your son had another misadventure. What? How did he get free? The guards aren't talking, sire. It appears he bit their tongues off before he burned the village of Pell Chalice to ashes. Six hundred souls. It's the fifth such slaughter this season. Oswald's face went ashen. Even for the feared Mad King of Crater, this news chilled his blood. Rumours state it is about a woman. News of Pelchilis has stirred the populace. They fear you've lost your mind. The Mad King raised an eyebrow at Dribbin. What I mean, sire, is that the crowd fears you've abandoned your normal, regal predilections for pure animalistic butchery. Where is my son? He's residing in your throne room, sire. Insolent brat, Oswald sighed. I'll handle this myself and find out why those sandwich trees failed. Oswald threw open the doors of the majestic throne room, his voice booming as he crossed the great gilded hall. You want a woman to love you, Eddie. You take her father hostage, not murder a village. You never did pay attention to my lessons. Prince Edric Thorne sat on the throne in a slump. He was a lanky boy, barely twenty, with a head of spiky hair and both his lips and eyes smeared with pitch. Like all privileged boys his age, he had two facial expressions, scowl or smirk. You know I hate it when you call me Eddie. It's Edric, he said through a scowl. Or the bloody prince. Not this again. That's as embarrassing as when you called yourself Pain Lord. And you're not the king, so get off my throne. If I'm going to take your place one day, I should at least get used to the trappings of power. Edric sat on the throne smirking at his father. Besides, you never know when today's your last day as a king. But why Pelchilis? Perfectly good way to summon a mob, which you did. Never kill people unless that's a part of the joke, dear boy. The joke is you, including the punchline. I thought you would appreciate it. Oswald halted in mid-step. What's so funny about my subjects trying to storm the castle? Because I led them there. For years you played with your subjects, made them the butt of your jokes. I decided it would be a perfect way to end your reign and start mine. I used your reputation to ignite an overthrow. King Oswald growled, grabbed the prince and pulled him off the throne. When the boy hit the polished floor, Oswald leapt on him, pointing a finger in the boy's painted face. I've skinned, burned, boiled, skewered, snapped, exsanguinated, disemboweled, stampeded, frozen and catapulted my subjects. But each time it was the part of a wonderful joke. Countryside flooded, now stilts to everyone's legs. Worst snowstorm in a century, fire flaming debris at the villages to keep them warm. I care for my subjects. You just want blood on your blade. You are a grave failure as a thorn. Are you finished? Edric smirked. Because I know the rabble outside isn't. Surrender your reign and I'll go drive them off. Or I'll kill you where you stand and make them think I put an end to their mad king. Either way, I'll have the throne by dawn. In time, they'll forget you. Oswald let go of his son and backed away. An interesting offer, my boy. One I hadn't considered you having the brains for making. 
Give me until dawn to make my decision. No, father. No tricks. A delay, then. In the Undercroft, I have a wealth of armaments. Rare Ascalonian longswords that never blunt. A full set of hand-forged great dynasty sun armour. You could at least see what you'll be inheriting. Edric's mouth watered. Lead the way, father. As they entered the Undercroft, Edric expected to lust after rows of exotic weapons and armour. Instead, in the trailing rows of waning candlelight was an ornate metal box that would fit a man. Disappointed? asked Oswald. Now you know how I feel about you. You tricked me! You were always easy to fool, but I do have something for you. I take it you've heard of that box. Edric's face carved a new expression. Fear. The shell of insanity. That's what I named it? Oh, that name's terrible. I'll have to think of another one later. The last man you locked in there ate his own face. To be fair, it was an improvement. Oswald grabbed his son and kicked hard against Edric's knees, buckling him. I hate explaining jokes, but in this case I shall. If any other person had threatened me like that, I'd publicly execute them for treason. But no, that would make you famous. I have something far worse for you in mind. I'll go mad in there. Maybe it'll make you a proper thorn at last. Oh, a little going away feast for you. Oswald reached into his pocket and shoved a handful of candy corn into his son's mouth before pushing him into the reliquary and slamming the lid closed. Oswald shouted for Dribbin, who burst into the room ancient tome in hand. As Dribbin chanted, chains snaked over and around the reliquary. When he had finished, the box was entwined. Do not touch it without gloves, your majesty, Dribbin said. The ward will drain anyone who touches the box. Now, sire, far be it from me to question. Send him to Istan, Oswald commanded. My departed wife Zola had a desert island estate there. Let the sun fry what's left of my son's mind. Oh, and Dribbin? Your scribes are to go to the archives and erase all mention of my son. Sire, such an endeavour will take time, and I'm not sure we can accomplish this before the gates fall. The guards and your courtiers have already fled. We are alone and defenceless. Oswald loomed over the councillor. The Mad King says, even if this castle falls, there will be nothing about that failure that is my son. At dawn, Dribbin and his scribes reunited with King Oswald in the throne room. The records are purged, your majesty. It's as if your son never existed. Oswald looked out on the mob streaming through the freshly stormed gates. It was only a matter of time. Dribbin added, I dare say the only ones who know what happened to him are living in this room. The Mad King smiled, drew his sword, and eyed Dribbin's throat. Funny you should say that. Edric's reliquary never arrived in Istan. It was stolen and re-stolen by a succession of warlords, gamblers, priests, and poets who all met terrible fates. Its tale attracted Nalani Academy scholars who studied the reliquary until a war annihilated the school. Amid the rubble and years, it lay dormant until an enterprising scholar dug her way into a chamber and found a chain-wrapped box waiting for her. Hello, Magister Tassie said as she approached it. What's this? And that, as they say, is that. That's where we actually meet Tassie a little bit later, I guess. During uh, Halloween this year, we get to go into that very place. I like that um, they throw in these references, like, for example, to Zola, who was one of the characters that we had a lot of quests to do with in the first game. That was nice, and it's nice to see, um, as well, a little bit more around the circumstances of Mad King Thorn's eventual defeats. Like, it was tied specifically to his son, which is an interesting idea too. Like, we already knew that he was stormed and overthrown by a mob, and th there's even information out there, I believe, about how he specifically was killed, and, like, how they cut... Uh, did they cut his body up and then just move it around to loads of different places? There was already a lot of information about this event, but now we're getting that little bit more, and it doesn't, you know, um, conflict with anything we already knew, so I really enjoy that. A lot of people have been saying, I've mentioned it, I think, in one video we did this week, that, you know, it's kind of annoying that we have Mad King Thorn's son suddenly popped up and it's like oh well we never heard of him before well you know I, I think it is a given that he would have at least one son because he had so many different wives apparently there's even some uh, dialogue in game at the moment the references from the the bloody prince where he references his stepmother which is cool because he would have so many stepmothers but this was right at the end of his uh, reign I suppose it's interesting as well that that the mad king's thoughts went straight to Zola 
which is kind of weird. Like, uh, maybe it was just because that was the most destitute place that came to mind. And ArenaNet didn't want to, you know, go to the hassle of talking about some other uh, one of his wives that we'd never met before. You know, they would just use some of the information they've already given us as players. Uh, I, I also like this this uh, section where he's talking about him killing people as the butt of jokes. I actually had to re-record that paragraph because I started laughing as I was reading it. And it helps maybe to make you understand a little bit more of Mad King Thorn. Obviously, there's still a lot that we don't know about him. Why has he got like this special ability to come back once a year why you know and particularly this idea of the candy like uh, while he was alive we know very little about him while he was alive that ties him specifically to candy but they've got this here with the the bloody prince and you know he, he's left in this box to rot away and there's this idea that there's all this magical influence going on there but we don't know why that really exists and i think that will be something we get much later in the story of halloween for guild wars and this idea of this guy driven as well we already knew that everyone had abandoned the mad king and now we've got this interesting character go well not really interesting let's be honest but we've got a character that was still standing by his side at the end and i wonder whether there's any more motivations there or driven perhaps has something to do with this uh these bizarre circumstances that come around Mad King Thorn as he dies and becomes this supernatural entity. And there's a few other little things in there. You know, one of these fictional towns, Pell Chalice? Never heard of it before, but it's nice because it sort of demonstrates that, hey, places and locations, towns and villages change with the times, and it makes Kryta feel like, a, you know, a more living, real nation. And of course, as well, the other thing I, I, I've quite enjoyed reading about here was another reference to the Nalani Academy. I mean, these are cool places as well. This whole idea of, um, are people in Tyrion naturally born with magic and gifted in magic and to be able to use it? Or what? how does that work? They have started to explain to us. There was a fantastic interview uh, quite recently that talked about it. But um, they're, they're, you've obviously got the Nalani Academy. And this was a place where young people in Ascalon would go to train and learn how to use magic. And they were at, they were, it had a twin academy too in the ruins of Sermia, I believe. Um, and they were connected. So, you know, it's interesting they're explaining more about this. And I liked that whole little section of the law. This idea that in Tyria, we have a bit of... <laughs> Not a Harry Potter style thing, but you know, we've got this idea of people actually go to school to learn how to uh, hone their craft and so forth. It's not something the universe has tapped into much, but we do have locations like this, like the Nolani Academy, that demonstrate that. And it makes sense as well that such a place would start hoarding magical and powerful artifacts. Very cool that it's only just been discovered now. I haven't played the second section of the... Um, dungeon that we got with the patch so i don't know how this story concludes uh please don't spoil it in the comments either i'll try and play it like sometime today or tomorrow and uh yeah maybe i can give you guys a bit of a sum up of the whole story in its entirety once i finish that second mission anyway thanks very much for watching guys bear with me guys while uh everything sort of gets sorted out of the house and then i can come back hopefully tomorrow we'll have one of these videos i really want to put out so anyway thanks guys hope halloween's going well have a wonderful day and i'll see you next time